Hey guys, my name is Jessie Mew, and welcome back to Adam's Quest. In the last episode, Sila's life mission was fulfilled when she became one of the leaders to bring our tribe to the next island. She was kind of the head of this great migration, and she brought us to one of these swampland islands. We've been to one that's quite similar to this before, but this one is a little bit more promising because it's leading us toward a mountain next. Our next challenge island is supposed to be a mountain too, so I'm hoping that if this isn't the one, it'll at least lead us a little bit closer to the one we're supposed to get to. Then maybe we'll be on the right track for Adam's Island too. But in this episode, we're probably going to be focusing on a little bit of a baby boom happening in the tribe. We have quite a few females who need to give birth, including Sila herself. And she's actually probably the one who's the most regretful about it. I'm not sure if that's the right word to use, but she wasn't really sure if she should be going on this mission at all. Her mate Sunstone was the one who convinced her that it was the right thing to do. He kind of just knew in his heart how much this meant to her, so he wanted to make sure that she would make it to this island as well. But now she's wondering if she made the wrong decision, because she's not really going to get the chance to get to know her babies. She won't get the chance to pass her stories. And I mean, she was so close to her mother, I feel like she was hoping that she would get the chance to have that connection as well. If you guys remember, she and Cherry went on some pretty grand adventures together. They were the ones who found the Baryinas. Of course, she was the one who passed those two bluebird feathers to her too, so she knows how important her family is. It's just a lot for her to think about, and it's going to take quite a bit of convincing from Sunstone again, I think. I mean, once again, with him being so connected to Moon Eye and Crescent, he would probably try to convince her that they're going to allow her to guide their children even after she's gone. I think that is going to stick into her mind, but maybe not in the way that he was hoping, so we'll have to see what happens after she has her baby. Now, as far as the other females go, I think Rave and I should probably come over here too. She can settle right down next to her auntie, place down her nest by the coconut tree. Since she does have a peculiar love for coconuts, this would probably be a good place for her to have her baby. We'll have her go ahead and pick up the grass over here, and since we have some poison berries, I wonder if one of our fanged creatures could come over to collect that. I suppose Seasong could probably be a pretty good candidate. I would say Spook, but I feel like he's probably going to go in a different direction instead. In fact, we have some shells down here in the water, so if we bring him around, I guess we'll have to go this way. And with his water body, he should be just fine. We can scoot him all the way over here so we can pick up that shell. And maybe he could even offer it up to one of the other females in the group. I'm thinking in particular, Brightheart has probably caught his attention. They both have the water body. She is super, super pretty, of course. And she's the only creature here who has the antlers. So she stands out in her own right. I kind of wanted to bring her down here anyways. Maybe she could have her baby right next to the stream. We'll have her settle down her nest right here on the shores. Oh, you found a clown koi. Oh, we know who's going to be interested in that. Seasong, despite the fact that he can't catch the fish, loves to play with clown koi. So I wonder if he's actually going to go toward the tide pools too. I was thinking that Foxtail and Seasong would probably stick with the leaders of the tribe, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah, if he saw that, there's no way that he would not go straight after it. So Foxtail, you're going to have to catch up pretty fast. In fact, if we stick her over here... Oh, she could light up the rest of the stream for you. It's such a tiny little thing, too. Were you really living in this tiny, tiny stream, little guy? That's kind of sad. That's a very small home. Surely he's just basking in the tide pools or something. Maybe he's taking a little trip up the stream for fun, so we probably don't have much time to catch him. The thing is, I can't imagine that they would have much time to catch this fish in general, because with all of these babies about to be born in the tribe, I would imagine that they're going to be quite inspired to start a family of their own. These two are so close now. I mean, it just seems right for them to start a family, and with those stinky tails of theirs too, they're going to be very, very important for the Swamplands. So maybe this would be a good place for you to settle down anyways? I mean, with all this fish here, I know you guys would love it. Oh, and the clown koi seems to agree, coming right up to greet you, Seasong. Let's bring Foxtail over here so we can set up your mutation menus. Now we don't need to mess with any of the tails. I wonder if we should try to encourage that white fur, though. 
that's what we were doing with Foxtail's family. I wanted to kind of make it like its own branch of the family, and we don't often have a white fur in our genetics. So I think that's definitely what we'll do for Seasong's mutation menu. But as far as Foxtail goes, I'm wondering if we should also try to encourage the poison fangs. Like, we have quite a few of them in our midst right now, but they're just about to pass away, so I would like to ensure that it's going to stick on at least a couple of our babies. We have our Seasong. He doesn't have any major flaws to take a look at, so let's go ahead and place the white fur in his first slot, and then I guess maybe the dots in a second? Yeah, that might be a good idea. That way they can keep that in their line too, so they're going to start a whole new branch of the family over here. We'll have him breed with her, and then she can settle down her nest. And now we're going to have four babies to take a look at in this turn. Oh my gosh, you guys are in for quite the experience. That is a lot of tiny little babies running around. Oh, look at this one. That is a royal baby if I ever did see one. Oh my gosh, she is gorgeous. That orange fur and the black stripes. I mean, technically it's a mask, but they almost look like they could be Adam's stripes too. He has the poison fangs. Oh my gosh, I have never seen such a gorgeous tiger before. His name is Kurovan. I think we'll probably keep that because that is what we do with Adam's line. They always like to go with the old names. Though because he has the digging paw, I'm kind of wondering if he would lean a little bit more toward his father's side of the family. Maybe he's going to be a grave digger just like he is, especially with that grand mask that he's wearing. It sure is nice to see the nimble fingers too because that means he should be able to scoop up those poison berries that we found before. I guess he's going to be the one collecting from this berry bush. And he better get to know his cousin, too. Oh my goodness, do you have two Baryena Claws? Oh, he is going to be a strong one, isn't he? A six in strength. Actually, the lean body isn't too bad, mixed with the Baryena genetics, because that means he'll be able to move around a bit more easily. Oh my gosh, just like his mother, though, he's dark as night. And those eerie black eyes with the purse now is always quite the sight. It makes him look very, very menacing, just like his father. I'm kind of surprised that they named this baby Vankir, though. Like, there is no way that this is any reincarnation of Vankir. He can't even collect, as far as I'm aware. With those two Baryena claws, I mean, there is no way that he's going to be able to pick from the berry bushes, unless he just slashes them down entirely. Maybe the reason why she chose that name was because she was hoping for a collector. She really wants some way to pick up these coconuts. But he's not going to be the one Raven Eye. I'm sorry to break that to you. You're going to have to rely on Kuruvan instead. So one of the suggestions that that one of you left for this baby was Beowulf. I hope that I'm pronouncing that right. It sounded really fitting, and especially for a Baryena baby. So little Beowulf is going to be an interesting one for us to follow for sure. But let's go back to his half-brother. Isn't that interesting? Oh my gosh, they look so similar to their parents. I mean, you can't really tell that they have any Baryena influence aside from the Baryena claw. Now, this one over here is actually a little bit weaker, right? Because he only has one Baryena claw. Oh, the tiniest, tiniest bit weaker. It's actually because of that big body. You know, that might actually be pretty helpful, though. If we are going to go to a mountain next, our creatures are actually going to be in for quite some trouble. So many of them have water bodies and lean bodies, so it's not going to be easy for them to get around. But this little baby, Brightheart Sun, will be a great one for them to get to know. He'll be the toastiest creature on the entire island, and he even has the home island immunity gene too. So at least we know that that's going to get the chance to live on in our tribe as well. No. Oh no, Roro here. How on earth slow are you going to be? The webbed hind legs, the Baryena claw. I mean, at least he has one runner's leg, otherwise I think he would only be able to move like one tile a turn. How funny is it that? He's one of our creatures who actually doesn't have the water body, and yet he would probably be better off just hopping through the ocean. Well, that is sure to cause a stir between him and Beowulf too. I wonder if he's going to feel a little bit jealous toward him, especially if he finds out they're related. I mean, not only is he a little bit stronger, he's probably much faster. 
The difference is that since he does have a way to collect, that might be where Beowulf's jealousy comes into play. Well, going with another suggestion that you guys have left, I'm going to name this baby Sunslash. Seems pretty fitting of a bear, you know, baby too, especially with those big claws of his. So Sunslash and Beowulf are sure to cross paths in the future. But we have one last little baby to take a look at before we do any more turns. And he's quite interesting, isn't he? He does have a little bit of white fur, those dots, of course. But with that pale pink color of his fur, he almost looks like he is losing his fur in like big bald patches. He looks very, very scraggly. I suppose we could also assume that those brown spots are like a mud of the swamps. Maybe he's slapping that on his fur to blend in a bit more easily. For that matter, if he is losing his fur, maybe he's using the swamp mud to like overcompensate for that, like to try to fill in all the gaps. You poor little guy. I feel like he's going to end up being quite self-conscious when he grows. But as far as his name goes, I actually wanted to start using some bug-related names for these creatures. Since they do have the stinky tails and all of their babies are guaranteed to have it too, they're going to be protecting their tribe from the bugs, so I thought it would be a good time for us to bring that back. So we'll name this baby Meadowhawk, which is actually a name for a type of dragonfly, I believe. There are some really gorgeous names for dragonflies out there, so I think this family is going to use quite a few of those. But there we go, we finally named each and every last one of our babies. I cannot believe how gorgeous they all are, and they're all so unique too. That's what I love about this tribe, because it makes it really fun to tell their stories. So now, let's go back to the royal family because I feel like they have some pretty big decisions to make here. I definitely want them to see if they can have another baby together, now that both of them are on their very final day. It's always so sweet and poetic when two lovebirds pass away together, but in this case, I can see it being a little more dramatic. So we'll have Sunstone breed with Scylla, but then she is going to get a different idea in her head. She remembers how Cherry's soul was kind of trapped on the old island when she passed away under those waves. And she's wondering if perhaps that wouldn't be such a bad idea for her. If she was stuck here, wouldn't that be a great way for her to lead her babies from beyond the grave? She just doesn't feel like she can trust in Moon Eye and Crescent alone. She feels like she has to take matters into her own hands. So as she sneaks away into the shallow portions of the ocean, will have her plant down her nest. And this is going to be very risky. There is always a possibility that her baby might be born without the water body, so we'll have to keep a very close eye on them indeed. In fact, I think that's all going to be left up to you, Raven Eye. She is going to be the only one left here? After Sunstone passes away? Oh my gosh, you are going to have so many babies to raise, Raven Eye. I bet she never, ever imagined that this would be her fate. Well, let's bring her over here where she can gather up the nest, because I'm sure that Sunstone is going to rush out after Scylla. He's probably very, very confused, of course. Maybe he would try to desperately paw up at the seafloor, see if he can dig up some of those worms to remind her of Cherry's fate. But she's just not listening. It wouldn't even matter if she was because she's just too tired now. So this is where their final baby is going to be born. We will leave Raven Eye right here because I think she's going to have to swoop in and save the day, of course. And all the other babies should be able to come right to her side. It's a good thing she doesn't need much help because these creatures aren't likely to notice. Spook, after all, has his eyes still set on Brightheart. So maybe we should have him grab up that shell that he gathered the day before and bring it straight over to these quiet beaches. We already know that our pirate king can be pretty darn charming when he wants to be, so I feel like she would be smitten quite quickly. Maybe it would be a good idea for us to set up their mutation menus so they can have a baby together too. I do believe that we actually have one spot left open on each of their mutation menus, so this is actually a pretty good pairing for us to use. And we do definitely want to see that tail fin on more of our babies. I would love to see more mermaids popping up on this island too. Like, can you imagine? It seems like Spook is leaving mermaids behind on every single island that he visits. It's definitely a good way to mark his pirate conquest, I guess. So we'll place a tail fin into his second slot, and we'll do the same for you, Brightheart. And then we'll have her go ahead and breed with him. Oh no, it looks like it's going to take one more turn. 
Well, I suppose that's okay. They can spend one more night together, and then I'm sure that Spook is going to be off on his own again. He is our most restless creature of the tribe. So I guess that just leaves Foxtail and Seasong to hopefully carve out an area for their baby to play. Oh my gosh, and we actually have a berry bush back here too. Wait a second, Seasong. If you scoot on over here, then you can actually pick up some food for us. I don't think anybody else has really gathered up any food in the meantime, aside from Spook and his shell, of course. So let's see if you two can have another baby too. There we go. Much, much easier than Brightheart. I think that's because of her infertility gene, of course. Yes, yeah, Spook is not so bad, but Brightheart isn't quite as fortunate as her sister. I'm sure that's something that you never expected you would hear, Foxtail. She was always quite jealous of her beautiful sister. But I think we should be ready to skip the day again. So let's see how this goes down here. We have to see what sort of body this baby is going to have. So hopefully they'll be able to survive despite being born in the ocean waves. Oh jeez. It looks like she has the lean body instead. So you might actually have to rush down and save this little baby before she ends up drowning. But at the same time, look at her mask. Oh my goodness, the bandit mask. Is she actually connected to the bandit brothers? Oh, how very, very strange. I wonder if it's her proximity to the ocean that caused that, since they do love to steal the shells, of course, that the crabs leave behind. And for that matter, with her parents' souls being trapped on this island now, if we do find any crabs out there, I think we can pretty safely assume that they're probably the spirits of both Sila and Sunstone. They don't really have a choice now. They don't have a choice but to guide their babies through this because nobody else knows how to set them free. And don't worry, I didn't forget about the bluebird feathers. I figured that with Sila passing so close to her new baby, maybe they would float to little Sairi on the ocean waves and she'll be the one to cart them out of the water. So I guess kind of by default, she's also going to be the one to keep them with her at all times. I can't imagine that she would want to give them up knowing that they're the only thing that connects her to her parents. So before we go any further here, let's have a Raven Eye scoot down. We'll bring Beowulf right in her shadow. And now you have three little babies to raise. Oh, Raven Eye. She is definitely going to pull this little baby out of the water as soon as possible. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Unfortunately, she's going to take a little bit of drowning damage. But you know, if you purr for all of these babies, that might actually help out. Maybe she won't take as much damage as we thought, and she'll definitely be able to heal all of the damage that she does take over time. So in a way, there was no better creature to take them under their wing. I'm not sure if she would be the best one to share Adam's stories with them. To be honest, I'm not sure if she would even know about them at all. She definitely wasn't interested in that side of the family. But she does know how to survive on her own, so she's going to make sure that all of these babies know how to do that too. Now, Spook, hopefully we can have you breed with Brightheart this time. There we go. Then I guess she might as well use her old nest. We'll just change Sunslash's gem over to the golden color. And then, should we have him come over to the water side, maybe? Yeah, let's have him hop over here. And then maybe he could try to grab up that clown koi once it comes swimming back down the stream. And as for you, Spook, I already know that you're going to go diving back into the ocean. He's probably saying that he's going to look for some shells or something, more food to bring back to his babies. And I mean, it wouldn't be a complete lie. That probably is what's on his mind right now. But who knows what sort of distractions he's going to find along the way. That's actually very similar to how he ended up on this island in the first place. Like he was going out searching for fish for his babies to eat, and then just so happened to hear about this great migration. Now let's see what your very final baby looks like over here, Foxtail. Oh my gosh, he's like a spitting image of you. Oh, how pretty. The same fur color, the same spots. Oh, Meadowhawk. He's probably feeling a little bit jealous. Yeah, this is how I would expect that he would look if he did have fur. But he looks so patchy in comparison. Well, going along with the dragonfly theme, I think we'll name this baby Sand Dragon. And now let's make sure that your father is collecting you plenty of those poison berries. Hopefully we have some more berry bushes that we can pick from over here, though. It would be nice if we could gather up a little bit more food. 
because I am starting to get worried that we're going to run low pretty soon. I mean, once all the babies can collect the food as well, I guess it'll be okay. And they all should be growing up on this next turn too. So let's go ahead and pack up your final nest, Foxtail. And then I think we should be ready to skip the day. So let's scoot on back here so we can hopefully save Sairi from the ocean waves. I imagine she is going to take a little bit of that drowning damage. But at least it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Oh, three days worth of damage, little one. Well, let's go ahead and place that first bluebird feather on you so we don't forget about that. And for that matter, let's change her over to the rank of an alpha as well. As we go ahead and have Raven Eye hoist you out of the water. Just as the bluebird begins to circle overhead. And just as a leech comes out to attack you. Oh my goodness, Spook. The piranha fish, the leeches. I don't think our ancestors are too impressed with your conniving ways. Well, go ahead and scoop those shells for us. And then let's take a closer look at this bluebird here. Like, I wonder if perhaps that's how Sila's soul has reincarnated? As one of the bluebirds to guide her babies? Very, very mysterious. I'm sure she was expecting a crabbit, but the bluebirds have always been the guides to Adam's family. Kurovan in particular would have to be very, very curious about all of this. It's kind of funny because he was the one who was able to meet his parents, and yet he probably feels the most disconnected of all. He doesn't have the bluebird feathers to connect him to his parents, of course. He doesn't have their stories. He only has the memory of their image. So I wonder if he is really hoping that he can follow this bluebird. Maybe he thinks that this is going to give him that bond that he so desires. But with all the drama taking place with Sairi and all, I feel like Raven Eye would probably instruct him to go pick some of those poison berries, since he is the only one who can safely do so. So for now, we'll bring Kurovan over here. That way he should be able to scoop up all of these delicious morsels for his baby sister. And Beowulf? Maybe we should have you knock down some more of those coconuts? I wonder if we could have him do that. Maybe for now we'll set him up over here. Because I feel like he does need his extra chem before he attempts that. He will probably end up getting a little bit dazed if he settles down under that tree. But at the same time... He would probably want to really impress his mother. And what better way than by knocking down all of those coconuts that she loves so much. I guess while he's still a teenager, he could just try to like struggle to crack these open. He probably really wants to live up to Van Geer's name after all. And as for this little baby back here... Yes! Oh, he's one of the mermaids too? the water body this time, so he can actually go diving after his father much, much more easily than his previous babies could. Oh my goodness, Spook, you are going to be in for quite the fright. Maybe this little guy is just going to take after him in general? Like, he doesn't look very much like a Halloween baby, but I can definitely see him being some sort of pirate. His golden fur actually reminds me of, like, gold coins or something. A little pirate treasure. So maybe that's what we'll name him? Treasure, there you go, little guy. You might be the very first of our line of pirates after all. Taken after your father every step of the way. Now, Sun Slash. I wonder if we're going to be able to find that clown koi again? He won't be able to scoop it up as easily as somebody with the claws, of course. But I definitely feel like he would still try. We're probably going to have to spook it if it's still inside that stream. Maybe that would be a job best left to see song. He does have Meadowhawk to watch after Sand Dragon, so as we go ahead and change their gems over, maybe this would be a good way for Seasong to remember his fallen mate too. They did love chasing after fish together, so he can teach his babies that too. Actually, we could even have Meadowhawk come on over here and take up his father's role of picking the sperry bush. And of course, you can pack away that nest that your mother made for you. But it looks like you're not going to have very much luck in here with the Clown Koi Sun Slash. So I think you're going to have to go hopping into the Tide Pools after all. I guess we'll bring him down here. Ooh. Oh my goodness, the piranha is stalking you, Spook. Oh, that is terrifying. He's like peering from behind the sand. I wonder if he's calling his leech friends over to take him out after all. You know, Treasure, you might have to go jumping into the ocean sooner than you thought. Oh my goodness, Brightheart. The bird is actually directly over your babies? Well, jeez, you better stay close by then. Go ahead and gather up that nest. 
pick up the grass over here. She's probably clearing out this area, expecting Spook to come back, of course. Oh, but I think he's actually being chased away by the piranhas instead. You're not going to be seeing him anytime soon. So let's go ahead and skip the day one more time. So hopefully some more of our babies can grow. Oh no. Oh, Beowulf. You found our first Baryena of the island. Oh, this has to be Animium's role at play. She is not at all happy that Scylla just skipped out on her challenge. So now she's challenging little Beowulf instead. Well, the good news is, this is a great way for him to learn a little bit more about his unique strength. His 6 in strength means that even with just 2 gems, he should be able to land 12 days worth of damage on the Sparyena. In fact, if we just have one of these creatures come over to help him, we should be able to take out the Sparyena quite easily. But it's still a pretty terrifying challenge for somebody so young, and it's sure to shape his destiny too. So in the next episode, we'll see if you can conquer this foe. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye guys!